G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel today. We are getting into some of your bold predictions for the 2024 AFL season. Now I took to Instagram and I took to the YouTube community tab to ask you for your biggest and boldest predictions uh, for the 2024 season. And in this video, I'm going to react to them and kind of give you my thoughts on how ridiculous or otherwise I think they are. Now there were so many responses to this that I'm going to have to do two videos. So today is a bit of a part one and uh, maybe you know in a week's time or so I'll release part two reacting to the other half. Before I crack into the video, if you could do me a favor and consider subscribing to this YouTube channel for plenty of AFL content as we get closer to the 2024 season. It is almost that time of year where ladder predictions start coming out, pre-season analysis. In fact, I say that, but I've already started doing that. So if you want footy content, this is a great place to subscribe. All right, let's crack into the video and I'm going to simply go through what people have told me they expect to see in 2024. So the first one is from Arrakis2003 who reckons the Crows will make the prelims. And I'll tie this in with another one from Paddy Hardy 08 who says the Crows finish top four and don't lose a game at home. So the Crows making the prelims, I, I don't think this is wildly unrealistic. I think they do have a strong home ground advantage. We saw how well they played at times in Adelaide and, and decimated some teams we thought were pretty good at the time. I think St Kilda and Carlton come to mind, particularly in the first couple of months of the season. Whether they don't lose a game at home is, is probably a little bit more questionable. So I had a look at their home fixture. They've got the Cats, D's, obviously a home show down there. They've got the Lions at Adelaide Oval. The Tigers beat them there last year, as did Sydney, although I know that's controversial, but Sydney will be a good team this year. The Giants also beat them there. So that's actually a tough run of fixtures of opponents rather uh, at their home ground. So I wouldn't necessarily bet on that, but they are a strong home ground side. And if you back them to improve, it's not so crazy. Prelims are probably the upper end of what I expect. I think we could best case scenario see a Crows side that's probably not really ready to challenge for a premiership, but still be good enough to accumulate enough wins on their way to make a prelim, but probably be the weak link in that prelim. I think that is the upper end for Adelaide. I think that's possible, uh, but I think they're on the right track. Let's talk about some more negative ones. Two people, Druzy and Blake Mack, 4422, think that the Blues will miss the finals this year, which would be a bit of a shock considering how well they finished last year, one of the most red-hot teams of the comp. You know, halfway through that prelim, we thought they might have been on their way to a grand final against Collingwood, which would have been unreal. So, you know, if you, if you look at that trajectory that they're on, this seems pretty wild. I suppose the only part of this where I'd probably give it a little bit of credit is just the fact that Carlton can be up and down. Or to, to rephrase that, it's probably just with the, with the club that has the lack of track record of consistently living up to potential. Sure, that there, there is some doubt that they could implode for a year and then maybe come back or something like that. I, I will say that they will. I'll back them in to, to be a, you know, a genuine premiership contender in my personal opinion, because I think this is the most talented group I've ever seen from Carlton. Obviously, talent is half the battle, but uh, I'm gonna disagree with this one. Then we got a couple more suggestions. I think Blake Mack again, and Call Me Ismail, who both think that Justin Longmuir is gonna get sacked this year as Fremantle coach. This is an interesting one. I, I must say, it's not something I'm particularly invested in, uh, or at least prior to this question, but I had a look at his four years at Fremantle so far. So he took over at the end of the Ross Lyon era where they ultimately decided that the rebuild wasn't quite going to plan. They've replaced him, had a bit of patience. He finished 12th, 11th, then jumped up to fifth, and then back down to 14th. Now, I think from the outside of looking at Fremantle, I think they're tracking okay considering how young this group is and they've had their obstacles in losing mature depth. So I think it's fair to be fairly patient with their expectations, but that doesn't mean that Longmuir won't face scrutiny if Fremantle have another season when they finish in the bottom five, which I'm not expecting. I'm probably a little bit more flattering of Fremantle than what seems to be being set out you know, in the general media landscape. There seems to be a, a bit of an a expectation that Fremantle will bottle this season as well. I think I see the shoots of a pretty good team, whether that's finals, probably not. But I equally think that if Fremantle don't improve on last year, they've got enough reason to improve, that there will be some serious heat on Longmuir if he doesn't, you know, get to that probably a 10th or 11th part of the ladder. So I like it as a bold call, there's logic to it, but I, my gut feeling is Fremantle will do enough to avoid that happening. 
We've got a qu couple around Hawthorne now. So Leo King, member of the channel. Shout out, Leo. G'day, guys. I just want to interrupt this video for one moment just to let you know that this video is proudly brought to you in a paid partnership through BetterHelp. If you're unaware, BetterHelp is a platform that connects you to a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give you unbiased, helpful advice. We've talked a little bit about like mental health and looking after yourself, uh, particularly on the True Footy podcast. And I do understand that starting therapy for some people can be hard. You know, there's factors like the right therapist might not be in your area, or you know, there's something a little bit intimidating or confronting about having a face-to-face -face interaction. But the cool thing about the BetterHelp service is that you can arrange your sessions to be over a phone call or a video chat or even messaging if that is what you prefer. The way you can get started is by clicking the link in the description of this video or in the pinned comment or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy and you fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your specific needs. And in most cases, you will be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. If you are matched with a therapist that you don't think is necessarily the right fit, you can switch to another one at no additional cost. So if you think you can benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. You can access it by clicking the link in the description or like I said, going to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. Now clicking that link does support the channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp to see if you can connect with a therapist that's right for you. He says Hawthorne will make bottom two. They need to take a step back before they take a step forward. And then Moggs says Hawthorne make a huge jump from eighth to 10th. You know, I do think both of these are possible and I, I don't want to seem like that's fence sitting, but what we have is a very young group that is very talented and probably punching above their weight in terms of their age and experience, I would say, which does indicate, you know, good systems and a good coach, in my opinion. Now, logically speaking, I think Hawthorne's trajectory should mean that they improve this year. And I think particularly the back end of 2023, we saw some serious improvement, or at least from, from about round nine or 10, whenever they smashed West Coast. It seemed like they kind of turned over a leaf, a new leaf from that game. So if they take that momentum into next year, it's hard to argue that they're going to fall. That being said, young teams do have this capacity to just implode sometimes, even if it's just for a year. So I don't think it's wildly unrealistic. My, my bet is probably somewhere closer to that 12th or 13th region of the ladder. What I will say about them is that their goal scoring power has massively improved. They're completely rigid their forward line. So I think there's probably more reason to improve than to expect them to, to go backwards. Then we got Mitchell Barrow who says Geelong finished second and in the same breath says Jai Amos kicked 65 plus goals this year. So with Geelong, I think their best 22 is still damn competitive, particularly their forward line. I think their midfield needs it lacks a bit of a punch their back line's good their forward line's good and that's probably enough to potentially best case scenario get around the top six region in my opinion i think second would be wildly unexpected that in my personal opinion I, I don't quite see that same ability that they had maybe two years ago a lot of their veterans are older you know selwood's not there on the list anymore obviously important player to them and it would rely on a lot of younger fringe players coming up to fill that void and i don't know if i see that with geelong so i'm gonna i'm gonna say that that's probably a little bit heavy on the cats as for amos kicking 65 i also i know this is a bold prediction so i'm not trying to tear apart your prediction but to jump from 41 to 65 in his third season would be unheard of like I don't what would Buddy Franklin have kicked in his third season I think his 100 goal season was in his fourth year and Amos kicking 65 would be pretty crazy I'm gonna say probably not but then again it is a bold prediction Asha Watt says Collingwood get both Ben King and Bailey Smith at the end of the season I feel like you're trying to hurt me with these Collingwood questions Ash friend of the channel she knows what I'm talking about the thing with Collingwood is when you look at their draft capital and what they have to trade. They've already traded a future first rounder for Lockie Schultz. So getting both Ben King and Bailey Smith seems unlikely unless they're willing to give up a good player in his prime. I don't think that's going to be possible when you also factor in neither of these guys are free agents. So I think that's a pipe dream, but I think we could see one of them at Collingwood. We then got two conflicting opinions on the Essendon Football Club. First of all, friend of the channel, Lenny Fogliani says, Jake Stringer leads the Bombers to a finals win, while Rowan Disley says Essendon for the spoon. See, Essendon do have the ability to play finals this year, but again, I think... When you look at the back end of their 2023 season, it was jarringly disappointing. I think in the last seven games, they had two wins. They had some big losses, big loss to the Dogs, a huge loss to the Giants. Their two wins were two unconvincing wins over West Coast and North Melbourne. But the form prior to that was quite encouraging. And you look at the, t the talent profile of this team, a lot of young players about to hit their prime, reinforced with some decent jigsaw puzzles to fit into this better 22 to improve it. So long story short, I think Essendon's talent should put them close to finals. 
And I somewhat respect Brad Scott as a coach who can at least get the best out of his group. But that back end of the season does worry me because I saw that happen to West Coast in 2021. I don't think Essendon is going to necessarily do a West Coast, obviously. But the logic of them falling apart and winning a spoon, I mean, there's something to that, although it, it is obviously a wild prediction. So again, at the risk of fence sitting, I, I think somewhere in the middle, I don't see Essendon as my tip to win a final, let alone make it. I think there will be around the mark. Essendon winning the spoon would be pretty wild. But again, like I said, you extrapolate the last few weeks of last season. I'm sure Essendon fans are hoping that was just a one and done. Jay Bazza 98 throws in Daniel Curtin for Rising Star. I have talked about this a little bit. I think he's an outside chance. I don't think he's one of my primary contenders. But like I said, I think if he plays as a bit of an undercountable defender, he's a third tall, maybe chuck him at stoppages. I certainly think he's ready-made enough to impact at AFL level. I think he has no trouble finding the footy for a tall project player and he's project but he's relatively ready made like he's pretty physically developed i like this he's not my first choice but absolutely a major contender in my opinion certainly top four or five nate rasmussen says walsh and dacos to have the best season since 2017 dusty and then he says walsh beats dacos in the grand final so carlton playing collingwood in the grand final is realistic in my opinion um as for walsh and dacos having the best season since 2017 Dusty. Now, when I first read this, I was like, is he saying the as good as Dusty? Not necessarily, right? Because it just means the best season since then. We probably haven't seen a transcendent individual season since Dusty's 2017, hence why it's still talked about in the same degree of reverence. But I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I mean, it's a pretty big call to say that those will be the best two players of the competition. Um, but, but I do think that both will be certainly in the mix for a brown low. And it'd be interesting to see if these guys are top two in the brown low, then this prediction will look fantastic. AFL Legend 29 says that Richmond will start 0-10. So I looked at this and obviously I'm one of those many people that find it tough to grade Richmond going into 2024. Like they're a little bit hard to read for sure. Uh, but this season starts with an away game against the Gold Coast Suns, uh, which is winnable. But I still think that that will prob I'm probably going to tip the Suns in that game. Then they've got the Blues, the Power, the Swans and the Saints. All sides who played finals last year or made the top four or got to a prelim. That's just the names in the first you know, month or so. And then you've got West Coast in Perth in round five is winnable. So to bet on them losing all of those games and then lose to West Coast in Perth, that's followed by games against Melbourne, Fremantle, the Bulldogs and the Lions. So there's some formidable opponents in there, but also some very winnable games there. I think it's a very bold call. I wouldn't put any money on it. If they're 0-10, then geez, they must be locked in for the spoon by that point, considering they would have lost to West Coast. Brooklyn Keynes, a member of the channel once again, shout out, says Melbourne to slide to the bottom four and Adelaide to make top four. So we talked about Adelaide already. I see that being possible, but I do think if they do make it, I'd be shocked if they're a genuine premiership contender. I just think it might be a case of accumulating enough wins and then, you know, in a few years, they'll be ready to genuinely be a premiership team. That's the way I see it anyway. Melbourne side of the bottom four would be completely predicated on that club imploding. And we are hearing a lot of noise about that this off season, obviously with talks about culture and stuff like that. Maybe it's because I'm an Eagles fan. I feel a little bit defensive of Melbourne. I, I'm, I'm going to wait and to see how they turn out in 2024, but... I wouldn't get around a Melbourne bottom four call. Uh, that being said, it is a bold predictions video, so I appreciate your submission. Darcy5927 says Saints for top four. <sighs> you know, I don't hate it. I really don't hate it. It would be a surprise, and that's why it's bold, and that's why I included it in this video. Uh, I think that they have the pieces there to at least be a really tough team to beat. Very tough team to break down defensively. And I think they've got a good game style supplemented by some new recruits that have clearly come in to inject some speed and class and a very talented young group. I, I don't see the, a premiership team this year or a team really capable of competing you know, deep into finals, but with a competitive game style like they do and being able to execute that for 24 rounds for a start, that's a th another thing that's plagued St. Kilda. So I'm not going to bet on top four, but I don't think that's horrid. I almost like it more than St. Kilda falling away to the bottom eight. I, I, I think that's not likely either. We've got a call here from Watto the Wizard saying Hawks forward line to score the most goals, and he specifically says 400. Then Smith611 says Hawthorne to beat Collingwood and Geelong twice. So it's worth noting that the Hawks forward line comment is from Watto the Wizard. So clearly a Hawks fan. Um, I don't know if I'd agree with that. I think they will probably take some time to gel as a mix. There's a lot of new plays in there, but we got some guns in there. There's Gunston and Bruce obviously come to mind. Mitch Lewis, the fitness of Mitch Lewis, I think is so key here because he is probably central to this one coming true, right? So uh, obviously as the number one key forward, generally they kick the most goals in a forward line. And we've seen him probably produce the form that makes you think he could 
kick 60 plus goals in a season. Absolutely, he just hasn't been fit long enough. Last year, we saw Adelaide was the highest scoring team last year. They didn't play finals. If we expect Hawthorne to probably finish in that same region of the ladder, I think Adelaide finished 10th, then it's possible, but I'd probably bet against that. But I do, I actually don't think that's horrid. Mason Batesy says, Eagles to win three games in a row and still finish last. <laughs> that's actually, that's ballsy. I think if any team wins three in a row though, they're probably not gonna win the spoon considering four or five gets you close to avoiding it. Uh, but I did actually have a look at the fixture and I found the three week window where we might have a chance. The Saints at home in, tw in round 13, purely because we played well against them there last year. Round 14, North at home, we beat them last year. Round 15, the Dons away, we lost that by one point. I'm not saying those are necessarily that's gonna happen. I'm just saying those were probably, based on last year's form, the three most likely rounds. But I would disagree and say that you can win three games in a row and finish last. Well, I think that would be crazy, put it that way. Rogue Riot, another member of the channel, shout out, says Sydney and GWS to play in a prelim. I like that, absolutely. I think both of these teams will be in the thick of it this year and what an exciting prelim that would make. He then goes on to add a Collingwood prediction, saying the small forwards of Hill, McCreary, Schultz, and Elliott to kick 25 goals each for the year. Then he mentions Hill being All-Australian and Finley McRae being a Brownlow medalist. I think that last one's a joke. So I had a look through the numbers. Hill kicked 33 last year, McCreary kicked 17, Elliott 39, and Schultz kicked 33 for Fremantle. So three out of those four seem likely. The one I don't think McCreary really has it in him to kick that many goals. I really don't think that's his one wood. I think he's more that sort of dynamic pressure style um, team kind of player, if that makes sense, particularly if Schultz comes in. I know it's a bold prediction, but I am going to analyze the teeth out of it. I think McCreary might be the weak link in there. Bobby Hill being all Australian as well. I think there's too many other contenders that will probably beat him out for a similar role. Like Charlie Cameron's a, a clear example. I do think Cozzy Pickett might be one to watch this year as well, but he's obviously a fantastic player, so we'll see. We've also got a Brownlow medal related one from Riley Burke, who says a non midfielder wins the Brownlow medal. And also mentioned Jay McLean's prediction here, who says a four way tie for the Brownlow medal. Can you imagine that? And he's mentioned that a key forward will be one of them, which is a rarity as it's usually a midfielder's award. So I've just come up with a few suggestions of who that could be. First of all, I think a tied Brownlow, I think I've bet on almost every year just because I think statistically it's got to happen soon and yet it never does. Surely it's not rigged, right? Uh, that being said, a few candidates of key position players or non-midfielders that I think are the, the most likely that come to mind. I think Jeremy Cameron, absolutely, just because he, he can also push up the ground and win plenty of the footy. Uh, Tim English is a is a chance just because he's super consistent in winning the ball. I don't think he's a realistic chance. Jamara, could Jamara pull out a season like Buddy Franklin? Buddy Franklin didn't even win the brown low. Dusty, now he's more of a permanent forward these days. So technically, he could win the Brownlow as a forward. It's super unlikely. Charlie Kerno, obviously, you have to mention as well as a likely common medalist. I think it's possible he gets the 90-plus goals in a season. Uh, and then there's probably another one like Toby Green, actually, uh, comes to mind as a forward. He could probably pull well enough to get close. But then again, he kicked 66 goals last year and didn't didn't get close to winning. Uh, and then Daycost, does he, does he count as a halfback flanker? Probably not. But those are just my best options, but I think it's going to be a midfielder for sure. Lucas Matarozzo says Sydney will go undefeated at the SCG. Um, I'm going to disagree with this one, not because I don't think Sydney will be a major player this year. I just, from memory off the top of my head, I don't think they're super strong with the home ground advantage. They're more of an anywhere, any team kind of team, but uh, at the same time, their home ground advantage just hasn't really been that strong. Um, some home games they have this year are the D's, uh, the Giants. I think the Di Giants have beaten them at the SCG not too long ago. Um, Carlton will be there. The Cats usually give them a good run for their money. Fremantle will beat them there last year. Uh, then they've got Collingwood in Sydney as well. Um, so I think there's some tough matchups there. Uh, so I'd bet against that. But then again, it's your bold prediction. Real Swift, uh, member of the channel, shout out. Says Ruben Jinby or another second year youngster to poll 10 Brownlow votes. Out of the second year youngsters, I presume you mean at West Coast, there's only Hewitt, Long, Marrick and Burgeel, I think that come to mind and maybe Barnett. Uh, I'd say Jinbi is by far and away the most likely out of that group. To do it, I would bet against it, but I do think we'll see a big upsurge in improvement if he does hit 10 Brownlow votes. Very, very stoked. King Dreamer says Nick Day goes to win every individual award. Yeah, except Coleman. I presume you're including Coleman in that, so um, no. Uh, Wild Coast says Shannon Neal to force out Tom Hawkins out of the Cats' best 22. That's a huge call. I, I, I do think it's going to be a changing the guard at some point here for Geelong. But Shannon Neal has played five games and three last year, so I don't know if I back him in to force him out of the team. 
but you know this could be Hawkins last year surely right so maybe they play alongside each other it would make sense to give Neil some opportunity the Hoops crew shout out I have done a interview with them recently that should be out in the coming months I think but the Hoops crew is a John fan channel go check them out uh, they say Oli Henry to kick 55 plus goals now, this is this is kind of a really good uh, bold prediction that it's not wild but also makes you want to go probably not that makes it a good bold prediction Ollie Henry kicked 41 goals last year and 55 does not seem completely out of his wheelhouse. It's a little bit harder for those medium types to hit those sorts of numbers with goals. Uh, but that being said, he's doing it at his age. It's very impressive. So I think it's possible, uh, but obviously unlikely. It would make him an All-Australian for sure. Jufus says, another player will be hit with a drug ban. Uh, but then he also says, a player outside the top five in 2023 will win the Brownlow medal. Uh, so I just had a look at some of the names that finished outside the top five, which um, and there's some good plays in there. Petrarca is one of them. Caleb Sarong's another. Patrick Cripps, the previous winner. Noah Anderson and Connor Rosie. So just without even going too much further into it, there's easily Brownlow medal quality in there, particularly Petrarca Rosie. And then obviously Cripps won it, but Sorong and Anderson, I think they're, they're, there's all they're all potential winners in my opinion. Shadow Light says Geelong, Richmond, and Fremantle will all finish lower on the ladder than what they did in 2023. Another really nice bold prediction. So Geelong finished 12th. I think they'll I think they'll go higher, not lower personally. Richmond 13th. I think they're probably more likely to go lower than higher than that. Fremantle 14th, I'll also back in to go higher, but I think that's all Yeah, that's all subjective. Uh, but also, it's juicy. I like this one. Levi McIntosh says North to finish above the Hawks. Um, I wouldn't bet on it. I think that would... Obviously, North would need to improve in that instance, and I would expect them to improve, but I think it would also rely on Hawthorne crashing into a ball of flame to some extent, and it just seems unlikely to me unless they have an injury crisis. Matt McCann says, Jack Darling will not be in the Eagles' top three goal scorers this year, but Ryan Marrick will be. I think this is a long shot, Matt. Uh, Allen kicked 53 last year, but behind that, Darling was second with 26. Uh, Cripps kicked 16 in third, but he only played 12 games. And fourth place was Waterman, who only kicked 11 from 11 games. So it was a bit of a decimated Eagles list, as we know, last year. Uh, Marrick kicked nine goals from 10 games. Can he make up the gap on Darling? I suppose it's possible. But I will back Darling in. So I'll disagree with you, but I would actually be really happy if Marek's in the top three goal scorers for West Coast. That would be unreal. And finally, Levi McIntosh says he predicts true footy 40,000 subscribers this year. Thank you, mate. I hope that's true. I am manifesting it as much as I can at the moment and working very hard. So that will do for today's video, guys. There is a heap more that I might keep doing this as the season progresses. There might even be room for a part three because I don't think I read out all the ones that I intended to, but I want to keep this at a watchable duration. But for now, let me know in the comments what you thought of the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.